Today I'm going to be ranking Piranha characters by their strength, including the likes of Apollyon, Griffin, and Ramiel. So this is going to be a little bit different to the kind of tier list you normally see going around, because I want you to separate these characters from their sort of multiplayer counterparts. For example, I don't want to see our X character beats Y character because X character is more meta. We're not, we're not looking at that. We're looking at the sort of lore and feats of the characters. So for example, we've got a lot of story mode characters here. So we're going to be looking at what they do in the campaign and what their history is and how they sort of rank based upon that. So at the bottom, we've got the minion tier. These guys, the only thing they're really good for is killing minions. Anything above that, they're gonna struggle a little bit, okay? The hero tier is sort of your average For Honor fighter, because everyone in the world of For Honor, they've sort of got to be up on their game if they want to survive, you know? It's, it's, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. The legends are the heroes of their respective factions. Main character, they're sort of only gonna be stopped when the plot demands it, okay? They have plot armor, which sort of puts them above everyone else by default. And then you have the god tier, which is just, they're going to obliterate everything else. There's no competition. It's, it's just, it's almost an unfair advantage, okay? Why is the elephant on the list? That is a good question. I, th I think it'd be a good meme to put the elephant in because I think it's an underrated aspect from the campaign. Everyone always forgets about the elephant. I'm going to start with the man himself, the big HD, Herbie D, okay? Now, I think he's probably a good person to start with and sort of to judge everyone else by because he is a good fighter when, when you're looking at it. As we see him in the campaign, he's able to dispatch people on his own. But I think he's kind of clever because he knows when he's going to show off in front of somebody who's weaker than him. But as soon as he's presented with like a bigger threat, like someone he knows he's not going to stand a chance against, like Holden Cross, for example, he's out of there. Like he doesn't want to get involved in that. And while that is good for survivability in a straight up fight, in a one-on-one, -on -one, that's not gonna get him very far unless he's just gonna leg it. And I should say, I didn't mention it at the beginning, but the scenario here is right. It's, it's a 1v1. They've got no, no prep time, no backup, no qualms or anything like that. It's just 1v1. They're locked in a room and only one person's coming out. Okay, who have we got next? That is Siv. So Siv is the boss in, I believe, the second mission of the Viking campaign. Raider! Got this rage, you know, and that, that's it. And I think against, like, the uninitiated, that's going to do very well. Anyone who can hold themselves in a fight is just going to defend, wear her down a little bit, and then once she's expunged all of that rage, rage she's just going to go down like a sack of potatoes, okay? I would place her firmly in the minion tier. I think even Daubeny quite easily dispatch her, okay? Stigan. I'm gonna talk about the characters I like to refer to as the mentor characters, okay? Being Stigandir, uh, Ayu, and Holden Cross. I'll talk about that later. Actually, no, let's, let's, let's talk about them all now, okay? I'm gonna get a bit sidetracked here, but I actually think these guys are some of the more interesting characters in, in For Honor. Obviously, Holden Cross has sort of survived the transition into multiplayer, hasn't he, For, with Griffin, who I'll get onto later. But they, they feel more like main characters in their respective campaigns uh, compared to the actual main characters, like they're more fleshed out and developed. I think they all fit into the legend tier. Okay, but then the question is, who's going to be who? I, this hurts me because I love him and I love his fashion, but I think Stigandi goes at the bottom of these three, okay? Because he doesn't really have any major feats in, in the game or the lore. All we know about him is that he's a great leader, he gets captured by Siv, who's down here, but we don't know the circumstances for how he gets captured. And then he gets rescued by the raider and he gets appointed as the new Jarl after the big old uh, Goodmunder takes a fat L. And his only real feat is the, um, he storms into the, the harbor, dispatches quite a lot of Blackstones by himself, to be fair. And I would also like to point out that he climbs the wall on the Sanctuary Bridge mission and single-handedly gets the gate open. So I think there's something to be said for that, but there's nothing sort of super impressive there because both Holden Cross and Ayu both do the same thing, okay? They storm in single-handedly and they hold their own against lots of enemies. So the question is between these two, who's the better one? Now, I think Ayu is actually a really underrated character in in the lore. And she's, I'd like to see her get the Holden Cross 
uh, griffin treatment. She's got a really cool story where she's this disgraced samurai and she goes off and she wants to sort of reclaim her clan's honor and sort of by doing that she's going to hunt down the other three daimyo in the forest to prevent them sort of fighting amongst themselves like Apollyon wants. So she's sort of almost one step ahead of Apollyon in that sense. And I think if it came down to Ayu and Holden Cross maneuvering troops against each other, Ayu wins that, but that's not what we're doing. Now Holden Cross, I believe Apollyon, there was a really good quote Ah, here it is. There we go. I knew it was on here somewhere. So she calls him a practical man of limited ambition, but of endless talent, which obviously sums him up quite well because he's in a position where he's just sort of mindlessly following Apollyon. And when he's executing prisoners, he doesn't sort of understand the concept of why she wants to let Ragnar go because she sees him as a wolf. He's, he's, he's a soldier, and I think that's also part of his character development that kind of happens off screen between single player and multiplayer when he comes back as is Griffin and that's all he's sort of ever known but I think you give him a job to do and he gets it done and if he's sort of in that circumstance he's going to do whatever he can to accomplish it but if you ask him to sort of think outside of the box in any other scenario like it's just not really going to happen that's not that's not what he's about but I just think he has that physical prowess and strategy and he's just going to adapt to whatever IU throws at him but I think it's it's very close I think it's close Next, we've got Fujikyo. Now, if I don't put Fujikyo in like God tier, I feel like he's gonna be he's gonna be upset with me. You know, I think Fujikyo is another interesting one. I'm not actually gonna put him in God tier. I'm sorry. He's another character that's got quite a bit of lore behind him that we don't really get in game unless you seek it out. And he is he's supposed to be this sort of legendary warrior within the samurai. Who impressed the emperor so much with his abilities that he was gifted the command of the sea fortress so i think that's interesting because he sort of earned his his merits if that makes sense so the question is where does he go i think he trumps dormany pretty pretty easily okay but i would i'm gonna i'm gonna make a hot take here i would argue that he maybe even goes up here and i feel like there could be, even be a competition between these two but I, i'm gonna leave Stagander here because i think he has more feats in game and this this is gonna be an absolute nuclear take now this is going to get me in trouble but i think tozin's kind of a little bitch i'm not going to lie i think he's the weakest of the three campaign bosses mainly because he just relies on these sort of deception tactics and arrow strikes and when you actually fight him he's so defensive he just kind of sits there and he, he's very defensive and reactive but anyone that sort of knows what they're doing it's not going to work on them so I'm going to drop him over here. I think he, he, he's at the top of hero tier because he is meant to be like the samurai's best general or whatever. But I, I, I think against Fujikyo, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do, that, do that well because he's got these... Say he doesn't have the shadow clones, remember? Because I said no, no tricks. The, this 1v1, he's not summoning in his three shadow clones because that is his first phase of his boss fight. It's not even him you're fighting. And I, I believe they added to the lore later on, didn't they? That... Um, the shadow clones that he summons are actually supposed to be the Kyoshin. Obviously, at the time, they're not physically the Kyoshin. They're not using the same movesets and weapons, but obviously, he has the All Guard, which was then used as the main part of the Kyoshin's moveset. So, his main Shinobi for Yeah, exactly. He's. I just don't see it. I, I, I don't think he's, he would stand a chance against Fujikyo, let alone these three guys here. Tozen is a great tactician. He uses all his tools like archers and Kyoshin clones, but combat wise, he's very standard the other name characters yeah exactly yeah take away his his bag of tricks and he's he's just not he's not made of that tough stuff you know he's not the one he ain't that guy <laughs> he's not he's not the one akuma i don't think he's got many feats maybe i think there's an argument to be made that he's, he's a shigoki which just gives him points because he's a big boy he's big boned he's built like a brick shit house he does lift that gate up and hold the gate and then goes off on his own to fight waves of blackstone so i think I was going to drop him in minion tier, but I think that might be a bit harsh. And he does roll with the Emperor's Champion. I'm going to call him the Emperor's Champion. I'm not sure if that's exactly what he's supposed to be called. So I, I would put him here. Amiji, I'm going to shit on right now. I don't know. All she does in the campaign is get shot in the leg with an arrow. And she was a bit of a burden. And then almost gets Emperor Zoroji beaten up. That's, like, I'm trying to think what else she does. I think there's a part where she encourages you to use poison traps, but that's just like a game mechanic moment, isn't it? So I think even Siv's just going to beat her up. She's just going to get flustered, <laughs> beaten up. Okay, then we have these three chaps. So we have Ranjakizan, 
Kuja, Sejuro, and Ayu with a five Daimyo, aren't they? And I, I would say Ranja is at these three here. We're just going to focus on these three, Sejuro in a second. I would say is the most powerful. When you, f I, I don't want to rely too much on the actual gameplay, but I feel like we're trying to differentiate some of these you need to a little bit. But she fights you solo, and she activates sort of revenge immediately, and she just goes sort of ham. She's more of like a traditional warrior, because she's meant to be quite um, pious, I believe, Ayu describes her as. So I think she's just sort of got that focus. So I would probably put her here above Daubeny because she's more of a seasoned warrior. Again, a daimyo. Kizan, I feel like, is just a guy. He's just hes just a big dude. <laughs> he's just a big dude in the forest. And he has like a little entourage of other dudes. But there's nothing sort of notable about him. And I feel like he's my second favorite big dude after <laughs> Akuma. I'm just trying to think if he would even beat Civ, to be honest. Uh, I'm going to say he's a daimyo. I'll leave him below Akuma, but he is at the bottom of hero tier. He's, he's walking. The fat man's walking a very thin tightrope above the alligator water, okay? Dakuja's just kind of like Batman with prep time, okay? Because he leads you into, like, several different ambushes and arrows, and he knows that he's not the top dog when it comes to a fight, I think. Is it just me or did the art team pull all of their resources into the samurai helmets and none into the rest of the armors? Yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I would agree with you there. And it's kind of mad, isn't it, that we don't have um, some of these helmets. Would Mimiji be in? I'm going to say no. No, Mimiji's still in, in the pits. Seijuro. He impresses Apollyon, so he has got that fighter's mindset. But I think he's like a little bit like Civ, maybe, where his rage and his anger is going to blind him a little bit and make him slip up. But I, th I think he's probably got a lot more combat prowess than Civ, even just going off of in-game. I like to call him the monster energy, Hirochi. Greatest warriors in the Dawn Empire. Yeah, see, uh, yeah, I feel like we get this a lot. Greatest warrior in the Dawn Empire, but I thought... Tozen was the greatest warrior. Should we check? I don't think the front of wiki storyline wiki seeing this much use in a long time, probably. Oh, so he's a legendary general. Okay. So there's a, there's got a little bit of difference. Yeah, I think Tozen would still trump Sejuro in a fight, but I think Sejuro would slip up because he's got my anger issues. You know, he's punching holes in the wall. I didn't mean to make the connection with the monster energy joke, but it works. He's punching holes in the wall. He's punching through the bamboo walls, you know. The elephant, or we'll come back to the, <laughs> the elephant. I don't know why the elephant's on there. Right, we've got Stone. Another character with a cool headpiece that we've not got yet. Stone, Stone, Stone. So I'm assuming cause the Conqueror law is that they're meant to be criminals. They're enlisted criminals. So he's fighting dirty. <laughs> he's spitting in your eye. And he's also in control of Citadel Gate, whether or not he's actually been appointed that or they were just suffering such heavy losses that he got put in control. But the one thing that winds me up with Stone, and I'm going to come back to this with Apollyon, is that cutscene, and I want to say it's like the third mission. He get, he, they're, they're sort of fighting, and they beat them, and then they get run up on, and Stone's facing the guys running up on him. He's got a shield. Like, I'm analysing this way too much, and the guy with the shield gets shot in the freaking shoulder, with the crossbow, straight off the bat, and then he's just out of the fight, and he's just sort of led there, like, oh, let Warden could defend me, Apollyon's gonna, gonna come in, you know, and he just sort of lays there, and I feel like that's pretty sheepish behaviour, <laughs> you know. I don't think he's gonna beat the big man, at all. Are we taking into account that each samurai is supposed to be ten times more skilled than the other faction's soldier? Oh, that is 100% certified <laughs> samurai propaganda. Okay, this is Mercy. Now, I feel like Mercy's a bit of a sleeper, you know? Like, I don't think she really even gets talked about at all because she's not got she's not got a cool ornament like Stone. But I feel like she's got more feats than Stone. She's an infiltrator, you know? And then I think she does eventually join the Warden, doesn't she? She, right, she's fighting she's fighting the Shigokis, okay? Yeah, she's small. It's, she could dance around them a little bit. Yeah, she makes one mistake and she's dead. Yeah, she's getting her head squished. But I feel like that makes her more dangerous because she's small. If people are going to underestimate her. So I think she trumps these guys. I think she trumps Daubeny as well. A Helvart Aruna, even Stigandir, they're kind of all portrayed as kind of idiots. I don't speak Japanese. I think this is done intentionally. Like they wanted the Vikings to sort of be these savages, mindless savages. A Helvar, like, he does nothing. I think he does even less than Stone. He's just sort of there. And he just says dumb shit. But Helva, he's got like some real stupid lines. Like when he walks up to the gate and he's like, it's no gate, it's just a door. And he just starts hacking away at it. So, in the bin, go away. 
Equally, Runa, kind of stupid, running into enemies. Does she beat Daubeny? Does anyone beat Daubeny, really? I think Mercy. I feel like Mercy is like going to be a skill check for here. <laughs> She's like the noob killer, <laughs> you know? Never forget Precursor. Ragnar killed Davis. Yes, exactly. Davis. Rip Davis. Most powerful hero. <laughs> the most dangerous man on this earth, Davis. Again, though, he's kind of a bit cowardly because as soon as the raider rolls up, he gets a bit of a smack in and he's gone. You know, he relies on fire flasks like any good Viking does in Ferrara. <laughs> Again, right, I, I keep coming back to Mercy. Mercy is like the noob killer. She's she's the tree sentinel outside of um, the tutorial area. Anyway, Goodmunder. Does he have his wolves? No, he doesn't have his wolves. Tozen doesn't get his, his shadow clones. Goodmunder doesn't get the wolves. I don't think that would be fair. I'm in two minds about this because he's obviously fighting... When he fights the Warden at the end of the Knight's Campaign, he's obviously fighting to defend his home. And he doesn't... I feel like he gives up at the, in the third phase of the fight. He gives up because I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I read that is when he sees the burning hut or whatever it is, I can't remember the name. Like the, the, it, I'm assuming like that's meant to be his family's in there or whatever, and there's obviously burnt and his family's dead. That's why those two guys convince him to run off mid fight. Got a lot of Viking Yars given the United Tribes. We see what the Vikings are like in the campaign. Okay. See, I didn't know that. I didn't know that he killed the other Yars. So if he's uniting them, that's pretty, that's pretty baller. But the question is, does he, does he, is he fighting hard, it is hardest when we see him to defend his home? And would he be better in a fight if he didn't sort of have that? And is he like worrying about it and if that's putting him off or is he fighting it as fiercest? I feel like that's the debate. And I think he probably is, is a Viking. He's probably fighting it as fiercest to protect the people in the longhouse. That's the word I was looking for a minute ago, the longhouse. So I think he's fighting to protect his family in the longhouse. And once they're gone, he kind of does just give up. But I think he's better than Tozen by a long shot. I don't think he's even close. He's got that raw physical power as well as the combat prowess. He's not just like a brute like Ragnar. I think he probably does trump for GKO. And Stigande. I think Stigande is like nerfed Goodmunder, isn't he? Because he obviously takes over afterwards. It's just sort of the process of elimination because the Vikings don't have any good leaders left. Uh, I think Apollyon's main strengths are like philosophy and her approach. To the conflict as well as being a good fighter don't get me wrong on that but I, I think like a lot of people may confuse that with her being a peak warrior like the best of the best i think she probably does go here at the moment she's up she's right up there she, she knows her enemy she's like if she's fighting holden cross she knows him inside out you know i was going to get onto that yeah so she beat uh, a lawbringer didn't she that's where her armor comes from that's why she looks different because again before warmonger character was a thing apollyon was basically just a warden like gameplay wise she's a warden with unique armor but in her lore or her backstory rather she killed the, it was like a lawbringer had failed to defend the village or something wasn't it from vikings because he was off doing whatever he was doing not being an honorable lawbringer Vikings kill everyone, and she's like, goes and kills him and takes his armor. So, which that also begs the question: Why? I need, I need an armor set like this. Ubisoft and Lawbringer. If that's supposed to be Lawbringer armor, that's been repurposed by Apollyon. But yeah, I think she does trump all of these guys. But I wouldn't confuse. I think she's definitely the smartest character. She's playing chess. These guys are all playing checkers. <laughs> she's playing chess. Let's do the protagonists because I think that's going to be interesting I think all of these guys go up here because they're main characters first things first I think Orochi is quite easily on top of the other two we know that he beats the warden because that happens in the campaign maybe you could say that the warden's holding back but I feel like warden main's just going to say that and they because they're like warden on top except we see the Orochi win so I'm going to leave him up here and I think it saddens me the raider doesn't He's a bit underdeveloped, and he's just sort of a bit, a bit of a lunatic, and he's on like so much tranquil, tranquilizer. <laughs> he's just running and screaming. He, he. I feel like the raider, like hero, should be the berserker. Berserker should be the raider because the raider's like just this wild swinging, isn't he? Although this is again, I'm going to go off topic. It's not really related to their actual fighting ability, but he, I think he's definitely the most underdeveloped character. wise obviously. I think the Warden's the most developed, but he has the advantage of obviously being the first hero. But going from this sort of 
bottom of the pile warder, climbing the ladder, seeing what he's doing is not quite right, and sort of doing something about it. And then even at the end of the campaign, I believe Holden Cross says, it's the warden that sent him to broker the peace between Ayu and Stagander. Yeah, and then the Orochi kind of has a little bit of a, an arc where he's supposed to be like this arrogant swordsman. He becomes a bit more humble, does the right thing for his people. And the, the Raider starts off with an arc. I, again, I feel like this is just kind of the shallow representation of the Vikings. He, he comes down from the hills or whatever it was to help the people after they're starving. And obviously the solution to that is just to go off and raid, which I, I guess that kind of makes sense. Once they've done that, that's it. Yeah, he just sort of drifts off into nothing by the end. And I think that just sums up the Vikings a lot which makes me sad because they're my favorite. Well, lore-wise, I think Apollyon could have actually just beat the Orochi and avoiding the obvious plot armor answer. I would like to think she wanted the Orochi to beat her. Yeah, okay, I was going to come back to this at the end and I was going to re-rank some of these main characters uh, without the plot armor, but I think there's a strong argument to be made that Apollyon sort of set up this big battle or a definitive battle, didn't she? And I think she was quite prepared to go down with the ship and become this like martyr, wasn't she? So I think there's a strong argument there that she lets the Orochi beat her or at least she's not fighting at 100%. Would Astraea beat Apollyon? No, I don't think so. I think Astraea's strong. I think she has to be strong to unite or form Horko, Horkos, Horkos, and even contend with Apollyon's image, you know, because if she's even a little bit weak, like her followers are just going to be like, you know what, no. And it's probably, you could probably even say at this, at the point where Australia comes into this picture, Apollyon's like this sort of mythic, mythical figure, isn't she? That sort of is split down the middle. You either see her as an absolute tyrant or as like this savior, convinced, she's like convincing people to become who they're meant to be sort of thing it depends like depends how you look at it which is what makes her interesting in the first place but Astraea's just like based her personality off of Polyon you know like I think I said somewhere in another video that she's uh says she's not like other girls but then she's based her whole personality off of Polyon so you know I don't think she beats my girl Ayu I think Ayu's cool that's not enough justification, but <laughs> I use Daimyo. She basically becomes the leader of her people. I think that's that's an interesting thing to point out, actually, because I know Stiganda is Jarl, but the raid is the boss of the Vikings, isn't he? And the Lord Warden eventually gets to that off screen by the time we see him in the Samurai campaign. She also beats Griffin. Is that true? Is it? Where is, is that source? What's your source for that one? I want to see that. So I was going to make a point that Hold and Cross. A Holden Cross Griffin, sorry, because I would like to put these as these as two separate characters, nearly. Like he, he's like Obi Wan Kenobi. He's Ben Kenobi. I feel like I need a Griffin story mode DLC just to see his life play out after he leaves Heathmore, because I would make an argument that he's like, whoop, whoop. But I don't know. Well, I think he's better than his younger self. Yeah, I'm picturing. I'm picturing. Ben Kenobi in the desert, one shot in. That's a spoiler for Star Wars Rebels. <laughs> it's been out for ages. Just a gaze. Cover your ears. We need one shot Darth Maul, okay? That's what I'm picturing with Griffin. <laughs> like, I feel like this is just in my head only. Like, this is completely, this whole thing's completely subjective, by the way. But I'm just picturing it. Griffin one shot in. <laughs> like, anyone who fights with like one move below a poly on. That character is the only character. I would say Apollyon's like the most developed, well thought out character in Ferrana, full stop. Then him, because he's the only one that sort of has this arc, and it's kind of interesting how it goes from single player into multiplayer. Because I remember when he Griffin first got announced, I was actually really hyped because it felt like sort of uh, the Ferrana story was getting a bit more of a little, little, little tummy tickle, you know, they're bringing it back a bit. Put him above Apollyon and join. Ooh, this is this is controversial here. See, because I was almost making an argument like there in my in my own in the precursor head cannon. It's like just delirious to everyone else. Let's do it. I'm gonna leave him there in case anyone else joins and they just play absolutely like what? <laughs> and I'm just gonna leave him there. Maybe come back to him in a minute. As a character who supposedly may still be alive in the current lore, who's supposed to be like thousands of years old from drinking wyvern juice. I think Ramiel's Ramiel is up here. Like thousands of thousand year old warrior. Thousand years of conflict, yeah, of training. I don't think anyone here 
is going to compare to that. And he like these people here, these these skin characters, are going to have an unfair advantage because as we're on, it really starts to cross over into fantasy, like pure fantasy. It starts to get a bit more wacky. Again, I think Mako's up there. She's got the demon dagger. I don't think she'd be quite as good as Ramiel. Again, immortal warrior thousands he's like hi he's basically he's like the highlander like there can only be one yeah he's one of them question is just part demon beat them all i don't think so yeah i think mako where she is and i think that means we can probably put jagumo here i'm looking forward to this halloween i'm hoping they're going to do something similar because i actually think that event's pretty cool moving on moving on to Bolthorn the curse the worst hero skin in the game no contest absolutely makes me very sad. What? I don't think he's out of a lot of these guys. He has like nothing going on. He's just like a raider, isn't he? Like a, a yarl, or is it like raven something? Um, he almost sounds like Ragnar, doesn't he? I'm getting like Ragnar vibes from him. Almost like it, it would be Ragnar. This would be him if he wasn't six feet under. <laughs> Both on without curse, heads mounted stuff. Is that's that's the actually yeah so Bolthorn's probably the only character on this list. I think this is done intentionally. Like they wanted the Vikings to sort of be these savages, mindless savages. It's in a worse off state unless the curse is supposed to make him stronger, which I, wouldn't be much of a curse unless he can't like eat things or do other stuff. It's like one of those double-sided coins, you know, like um, Hearts of Stone, which are Hearts of Stone or something, where he's like invincible but it's just dead inside. <laughs> Bolthorn low end of god tier. Over to it. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna put him. I think CB Civ. I don't I feel like I'm being biased. I feel like I'm being too biased because I just don't like him. Uh, maybe here. Like Mercy's gonna skill check him, send him back to the tutorial, I think. Okay, Commander Revere. Oh, she's cool. she's drippy though, isn't she? <laughs> she's, this was a drip, drip list. Maybe that's another one we could do a drip, drip tier list for one of the characters drip tier list. Um, maybe it will. I'm going to put her under. I think she will come under Australia because I think if she was stronger than Australia, she'd be leading the Orcos, wouldn't she? Unless she's got that mentality that she's going to take over. Who we've got Yin, Yin Chen. Another really cool skin. She does have a gun, okay? <laughs> so, Helvar's dead. Mamiji's dead. Shot, shot. One shot, two shot. Shot. Some plate, bit of leather. Dead, 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 undead but weak. Just get slapped with a sword. Mercy, dead. Oh, where was I? Ranja, dead, dead, naked, dead. Fijikyo, good for Fijikyo, like Matrix bullet time, slice the bullet. I'm gonna put her here. Because she's supposed to be hubby hunt inquisitor hunting orcos or heretics or whatever it was. I know she was like ridiculous in that. Test your metal. Well, that test your metal event kind of bugged me a bit because I made a video really hyping it up in the first couple of weeks. And then I think I released it just before week three and they came out with that ridiculous fight right at the end, didn't they? Vela is another character. I'm pretty hazy on I don't think she's going to have a wiki. Is she not just very similar to maybe to Revere? I, I want to say she'd like die as the Lord. She's not going to kill by Ocelot or I feel like she's similar to Revere, but I don't think she's quite on that level, is she? I think she may be a bit overly ambitious and that gets her into trouble. Yeah, maybe she's another Mercy skill checker. Maybe. Oh, yeah, I'm happy with that. I'll leave her there. Right now we're getting onto the big players. Jormungand is just up here. Like, I don't think anything's beating him without serious magical intervention in the bay. I don't think the Demon Dagger is going to do much. Yeah, unless uh, maybe Ramiel's like fucking Dragonborn or something. I don't know, but he's made a pact with the Wyverns. Is it like Dragonheart? Is he like is he like Dennis Quaid? You know, hear me out on the front of Minion. Well, this is the point. So we've got the Pikeman. He's actually yeah, supposed to be a Pikeman. I was just gonna do a funny and put him like up here because they're just ridiculous, aren't they? Okay, hear me out. Hear me out here. The Minions share like a collective brain cell. They're just an endless tide. They keep respawning. <laughs> <laughs> Even the Jormungandas shooting Godzilla beams at them. They just keep coming eventually. They're like rats and they just swarm him and take him down. So I'm ju I think that's justified. I don't think you can argue with that. That's 100% objective. Let's address the elephant in the room. Who can kill an elephant? See, this is a bit more re realistic. 
<laughs> Who, who's bombastic enough to take out an elephant in single combat? I don't think anyone in Hero Tier is going to do it. They're going to get beaten up, they're going to get impaled and thrown around. Gun, maybe. But it's a flintlock. One, she's. I'm. I'm. I'm going to say she has to reload. We're introducing a reloading mechanic in this one v one scenario against the elephant. She fires one shot. It's probably not going to pierce it. It's not like a uh, hunting rifle. I think elephant goes there. Elephant only moves makes a charge off a cliff. Oh yeah. Okay. There's the elephant's dumb, isn't it? We forgot about that. She's going to charge. Oh, and the the Orochi. Mm. Elephant has plot armor but not as much plot armor as the Orochi. How about that? Right, I think I'm going to wrap things up. It's been a lovely first stream. I hope you've all enjoyed yourselves. Um, we'll have to do some again sometime. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I've taken you all out for a date, isn't it? hope you all have a lovely weekend. Take it easy, stay safe, and I will see you all next time. Come.